All right, Jeremiah chapter 33 is a pretty long chapter. I'm just going to focus in on two verses in this chapter, starting in verse number 10. The Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord, Again there shall be heard in this place, which ye say shall be desolate without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever and of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. So what we see here, this is some good news. You remember the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah has got a really negative message overall to the children of Israel because this is right before they get taken over by the Babylonians and they get brought into captivity. And Jeremiah is one of the prophets that prophesied that message. Very negative book in general, but he's telling them here, he's saying, okay, this land that you're going to say is desolate because it will become desolate because they're all going to be taken away. He says, this desolate land, you guys are going to think that there, you know, it's not inhabited by man or by beast or anything. He's prophesying of a future day saying, you know what, it is going to come back. He's saying, you know, the, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, you know, the voice of them that rejoice, all these happy things. There's going to be happy times again in the future. And what I want to hone in on, though, here in this one verse in verse 11, it says, and of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. I thought it was a really interesting phrase, the sacrifice of praise. And this is actually um, referred to one other time in the Bible. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter number 13. We're going to be preaching about the sacrifice of praise. Now, obviously in church, we sing praises unto God. We sing praises unto His name. And this is what he's talking about, the sacrifice of praise in the house of the Lord. This is where, where they're referring to the sacrifice of praises. I think about that word sacrifice. Now, normally when we think of sacrifice, we think of uh, um, uh, animal sacrifice. At least I do. Because there's so many animal sacrifices in the Bible. When you're reading the Bible and you see sacrifice, you're thinking, okay, you're going to bring you know, a bull or a goat and they're going to offer a sacrifice and they're going to kill it and then eat the flesh. Um, we also think when we make a sacrifice, you know, with those animals, they, they cost, they have a certain value. You know, they cost a certain amount of money to offer up a full animal. It requires a little bit of sacrifice on your part to be able to do without that because God's given you all this increase, you know, and, and here you are, you know, whether you commit a sin or whatever the offering may be for, you know, to, to make that sacrifice, you're giving something up. But when we think of praising God, you know, what kind of a sacrifice is that? And when we think about a sacrifice, you know, how much does that really cost you? Now, a sacrifice is also, it's not just meant for the way you see it in your own personal, oh man, I'm really giving a lot here. Sacrifices, you got to remember, they're, they're designed for God. It's not all about you. It's not all about, oh man, you know, I, I put, you know, 200 bucks in the plate. That was a big sacrifice for me and I'm really hurting. Well, no, what you're doing when you offer a sacrifice to God, you're supposed to be pleasing God. You're bringing, uh, you know, the, the, the burnt offerings were burnt for a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. It's something that God is going to take some enjoyment in. Now, yes, he has rules and he has things that he, he laid out the way that he wanted it to be done of course, but it's, it's there ultimately. It pleases God. It pleases God when he sees people getting right with him. It pleases God when they're bringing, you know, in the Old Testament, when they're bringing their sacrifices, that's pleasing unto him. And it's pleasing unto God when you could bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. So when that word sacrifice, I don't think it's meaning that like, like it's such a, a hard task or such a big loss for you to be able to, to sing praises unto God in, un, in order to praise his name. But I think it's referring that the sacrifice of praise because it's something that, that God really enjoys and that God wants to hear when you come into the house of the Lord is to give that sacrifice of praise. Hey, you're coming into the house of God and one of the things that we do here is we praise the Lord. We praise God for his mercy endureth forever as we read this morning. The whole entire sermon based on God's mercy and how great he is and how good he is and all the wonderful things that he does. Hey, God is deserving of our praise. And if you could sacrifice anything, let's at least be able to sacrifice our voices unto God. 
It's not asking much. I'm not asking you to pull out a grand, a thousand dollars, and just throw it in the plate. You know, God doesn't care about that money. Yeah, maybe that would be a harder felt sacrifice financially for you, but, but God's asking for the sacrifice of praise. God wants you to use your voice to sing praises unto Him. You're in Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse number 15. This is the other place where it's mentioned. It says, By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. God is very pleased to hear the praises out of your mouth. And in, in Jeremiah 33, we saw that the sacrifice of praise in the house of the Lord. Excuse me, but in Hebrews chapter 13, it says, Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That's not just in the house of God. Hey, we ought to continually be offering up to God that sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, giving not just, and it's not just lip service to God, but, but meaning it, you know, using your mouth to express thanks unto God, to give Him credit, to just honor His glory and His majesty. Now, obviously, praising God, it's not just singing. Okay, we're going to get, this sermon is going to be more focused on our singing and, and, on, and on lifting up our voices and praising God that way. But when you, when you offer up that sacrifice of praise to God, you could praise Him. We praise God when we give our blessings for our food every day. Every time we eat, it's a time where we give God thanks. God, thank you for providing this meal for us. praising God. We're praising Him and for allowing Him to give, to, to give us these great meals and whatever it is in our life. You know, we ought to be praising God continually, not just with food, but with everything. All of the aspects of our life. Hey, thank you for another day, dear Lord. Thank you for another day to serve you. God, this you know, it's taking a step back. You know, you just appreciate His creation, whatever it may be. Just, just honoring and glorifying God's magnificence. He likes to hear that out of our mouths. You could say, "Oh, well, I'm thinking about head." No, there's you. You ought to give the sacrifice of the fruit of your lips. That's not just something that you do inside of your heart. So when we come into the house of God, especially, and we're going to be focusing on singing, you know, don't just look at the songbook. And say, well, I'm singing in my heart. Use your lips. And I know some people are smiling. You might think that's kind of funny, but, and, and it is a little bit funny, but <laughs> songs are meant to be sung, okay? And don't just use that as an excuse saying, well, I'm just singing in my heart. You know, God can hear because it's in my heart. No, he wants you to use your lips. He wants to hear your voice. And you say, well, well I don't sing very well. I'm not, you know, I don't have a good voice. Look, God loves you and God wants to hear your voice. You are a child of God if you're saved this morning and God wants to hear you. I know I love hearing my daughter sing. I mean, it's such a great joy to me. Now, are they professional singers? Do they like know how to hit all these, the right octaves and the right keys and the right, no. No, they don't know how to do all that. But you know what? I don't care. I actually love it. Love them for it. I love hearing that. The imperfection in their voices. I love just, just hearing them because they sing with their hearts. They're singing out their hearts, and that is a joyful sound. When we come to church and we sing these songs, hey, sing these songs out to God with your heart. God is going to be well pleased with that sacrifice. Don't be, look, it's not all about you. As I said before, the sacrifice is not about you. Giving things to God has nothing to do with you. It's about pleasing God. If God wants to hear your voice, if God wants the fruit of your lips, Give it to him. Make him happy. Don't think that God's going to be, oh, well, she just hit that note all wrong. No. <laughs> if you're singing with your heart, God's going to appreciate that. He's going to love that, and he wants to hear that. It's not about being the best singer. Now, look, in everything that we do, we should try to be really good at it. I mean, whatever it is, if we want to please God, yeah, try, try your hardest. You know, don't just, just give it a half heart. But if you're singing with all of your heart, whatever ends up coming out, however that sounds, if it's, it's, you know, if it's not perfect, so what? Ultimately, that is what God is going to be pleased with. He wants that sacrifice of praise, especially in the house of God, but also in your daily lives. The Bible says, so we're going to be in Psalms a lot, so go ahead and just turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter number 27. We're going to see one more reference to sacrifices, and we're going to get more into singing. We're going to spend, the, probably, I think the rest of the sermon is all in the Psalms. And it makes sense. This sermon is going to be mostly just focused on singing and singing praises unto God. The book of Psalms is a song book. And it's, it's the biggest book. There's the most chapters in the Bible, 150 chapters in the book of Psalms. 
They're all songs. And again, I mentioned that earlier this morning, but keep that in mind as we read this. There's lots of great doctrine packed into the book of Psalms. It's, it is a lot of teaching and learning from the book of Psalms. Oftentimes when I'm reading, I forget that it is a song book because it's like, I mean, you're just getting so much good stuff. But these are songs and these are the good songs that we have. We'll get that in a minute. So you're in Psalm chapter 27. Look at verse number five. The Bible says in verse number five, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. And he's explaining here how you know, God has set him up as a rock. He, he set him or upon a rock. He's stabilized him. He's his foundation. He's holding him up. He lifted him up above his enemies because God is so good, because God is so gracious. Hey, I'm going to, therefore, he says, therefore, I will, will I offer in this tabernacle sacrifices of joy. It's a joyous thing. Hey, most of the songs that we sing, they're extremely joyful songs. And there's a lot to be happy for in the Christian life. There's a lot that God does for you that we need to be happy for. And we ought to sing, sing praises unto the Lord. Let's turn to, um, turn to Psalm number 111, Psalm 111. We already saw in a couple of these examples about the sacrifice of praise being in the house of the Lord. We're going to look at one more here in Psalm 111, verse number 1. Psalm 111, verse number 1 says, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Again, God wants your whole heart in it. When we sing these songs, don't just go... Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear it. You know, just, just kind of, you know, not really have your heart and just sing because you have to sing. Everyone else sing around me. Well, I guess I'll sing. You know, you ought not to have that attitude. We ought to be excited for one and, and sing with your whole heart. Hey, sing it out. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. And, and really be glad and happy heart. You know, mean, you know, the songs that we pick, I, I make a point not to sing unscriptural songs, unbiblical songs, because we're going to get to that soon here too. Songs teach you, they admonish you, we learn from these songs, and it's going to help you get in the right spirit for church and for learning, and, and will really help bring us all together here. And um, that there's so, many, there's so many aspects of singing that are important, but one of the most important things, whatever you do, make sure you're singing to God with your whole heart. When we sing in church, sing out to God and just sing with your heart. That's what God wants from you. That's what he's going to be pleased with, that sacrifice. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 86. We're jumping around a lot in the book of Psalms. Say, Psalm 86. Because not only does God want you singing in the congregation, singing in church, he also wants you singing in your daily life. He wants you singing at home. He wants you just singing in general and praising his name. Look at Psalm 86. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. There it is again, with all my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. God wants us praising him with all of our hearts forevermore. Is there, is there an end in sight? No. And you know what? There's also not going to be an end in sight even when we get to heaven. God receives praises and songs unto his name. Even when we get to heaven, it's not just for church. It's not just while we're on this earth. It's going to be forevermore. So if you don't like to sing, just start getting used to it now. <laughs> start figuring out how to like it now because this is something that's going to be happening forevermore. We will be singing praises unto God in heaven. I can promise you that. And um, start learning to like it. And, and you know, I don't, I personally don't understand people who don't really like music or don't like singing. <laughs> music has always been a huge part of my life. So if that's you, I don't know what to tell you to try to help you with this other than just, 
Just try to get your heart right first. Focus on your heart. Think about the great things that God has done for you, maybe to motivate you to want to sing unto God and to just say, you know what, if God's going to be happy with this, since God has done so much for me, as it says here in verse 13, for great is thy mercy toward me. When you have that appreciation of God's mercy towards you and you want to please him, then maybe you'll get your heart right to be able to say, okay, God, I'm just going to try this. If it makes you happy, I'm going to sing with all of my heart unto you. And that's the attitude that we ought to have. Turn, if you would, to Psalm number 113. I'll read for you from Psalm 71. Psalm 113 is where you're turning. Psalm 71, 8 says, Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. You're saying all the day. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise all day long. As we sing this song, um, Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. It's like, I mean, that's, that's all day long we should, be, we should be singing praises unto God. Now, I get it. There's a lot of things that we do with our day. But he's putting this in here that this is something not to be ignored. It's an important part. I mean, the Bible says pray without ceasing. You know, sing all the day long. You know, praise all the day long. All these things that God wants us to do all the time. And the things that he mentions we have to do all the time are important. They should be part of our life regularly. Um, you're in Psalm 113. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. God loves his name being praised. God loves that exaltation. He loves people just praising him and, and speaking about how good he is, how righteous, righteous he is, how merciful he is. That's something that really makes God happy. And he's saying, look, from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun goes down, let the name of the Lord be praised. Now, um, in the Old Testament, they actually had... Uh, David set up singers. If you remember that, there were, you know, there was the, the priests and the Levites, they had their service of the Lord. And throughout the tabernacle, they would rear up the tabernacle, and, and each group of people were responsible for different aspects of taking it down when they had to move it and then setting it back up again. And then when they ended up building a temple, um, there were people appointed, David appointed a lot of people that were to be the singers. And people who would play instruments and music before God. And they were taken of the Levites and they were taken of, uh, basically of the Levites to, to do this type of job because it's still a service unto the Lord. And this job was an extremely important role. And um, I was wrong. I thought, I thought we were going to be going just in the book of Psalms for the rest of the sermon. But I actually got quite a few references. I forgot about this page apparently uh, where we're going to other places. But in First Chronicles chapter 9, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to, um, to Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going to be going back to Psalms soon. But um, the, the, the job of the singer, it wasn't just a meaningless job. And when you, think, when you go to church and stuff, you think about, oh yeah, he's just the song leader. That's not just a light job. It's actually really important. Singing is, a, is an integral part of a church service. As we've already seen with, with some of the scripture we've read about praising God and, and how much God enjoys that and the sacrifice of praise. But in Deuteronomy, or I mean, you're, you're turning to Deuteronomy, in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 33, the Bible says, And these are the singers, chief of the fathers of the Levites, who remaining in the chambers were free, for they were employed in that work day and night. These chief fathers of the Levites were chief throughout their generations. These dwelt at Jerusalem. So they picked the chief. I mean, the chief is like the top, right? The cream of the crop. They picked some of the best people that were first and foremost, that were respected men of the Levites to be the singers because that was the importance that was placed on this job. It says they worked day and night. They were employed in that business day and night of, of being the singers and you know, playing on instruments and doing these things for God. And it was something that was, that was an important task. And um, you're in Deuteronomy chapter 31. So don't do, basically the point I'm making there is just not to take the singing lightly. Because there is such an importance placed on it. You know, the chief of the fathers were the ones that were, that were chosen to be, the, to be the singers and the, you know, the song leaders and everything else unto God. It's not something that we should take lightly. Now, if you're in Deuteronomy chapter 31, look at verse number 19, because we're going to see here 
how powerful songs are for teaching and for helping us to remember. Verse number 19 says, Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen and fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. And see, what we see here is that God wanted to teach the children of Israel something that he didn't want to be forgotten. Because as time goes by, as the generations pass, what happens is God word, God's word seems to get lost. People seem to stop caring about what the Bible says, and they kind of turn their back on God, and they kind of don't really listen. They don't want to hear what God has to, has to say. But with a song, the songs can, can continue to pass on through the generations because Oftentimes, as you well know today, as I well know today, you have a tendency to hear a song. You could even sing a song without thinking a whole lot about it. You could get that tune, you get those tunes stuck in your head. I have songs stuck in my head for the past 20 or 30 years. I have songs stuck in my head probably for 30 years that I listened to 30 years ago, you know, over and over and over again, you hear the same songs that I can still tell you, you know, sing that song for you. I know the way it goes. I could probably hear the first couple notes and be like, yeah, that song is this and just know what it is um, because you just hear it so much. And because songs have such an impact on your memory, on your retention, it helps you to really just, just sticks in your head, which is also why we need to be extremely important on the type of music that we're listening to. What are the songs that you are exposing yourself to and exposing your children to? What are you going to just make sure is going in your brain and not coming out. Well, God wanted Moses to write this song so that they wouldn't forget that this was going to bear witness if, you know, when they do end up going against God and doing evil, they're going to hear this song. They're going to think about this song. They'll be singing it. They'll know it and be like, oh, God actually prophesied about what we're doing right now. And it was a way to get through to them. Now, which is why it's really important we pick out the right music. We, um, we use songs, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I try to go through the songs before we sing them in church to make sure that the doctrine's lining up, that we're not going to be teaching something, which is one of the reasons, by the way, we don't sing victory in Jesus. Because the very first verse is saying, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. And it's talking about salvation. It's talking about being saved in Jesus Christ and winning that victory. And it says, I repented of my sins. We know that is not how a person gets saved. Now, if it wasn't talking about salvation, if it wasn't referring to that, repenting of your sins, fine. You know, repent of your sins. It's great. But we're not going to be singing uh, songs that teach a false doctrine. And that's one of them. And there's, there's multiple others. I'm not going to go through them all tonight. But um, if you ever want to know, hey, why do, I notice we never sing this song. You come and ask me about it. It's either because, one, I don't know it. <laughs> Or two, I know and I just haven't really thought about it. Or three, it's got false doctrine in it. So, um, you know, you could, you could ask me about that at, at some other time. But we're very careful about what we do. Um, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Songs are meant to teach and to admonish one another. It says that's, that's one of the ways that we do that. That's what we do during church. We're teaching and admonishing one another when we're singing these great doctrinal songs. And again, the, same, the, the parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 5 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And in Colossians 3, he was saying we teach and admonish each other. But in Ephesians 5, it says, be filled with the Spirit. So another thing that saying these praises does, it's going to get you filled with the Spirit. And music is very powerful that way. And again, you see the... Um, 
the, the false religions, especially the Pentecostals, when they get ramped up to do their speaking in tongues, when they go get ramped up to get possessed by the devil, they use music heavily into that in that service to get you into this frame of mind, to get you to start, you know, jibber jabbering and slobbering at the mouth and falling on the ground. It's the same thing that the, the tribes in Africa did during their voodoo, during you know, all of their sacred religious experiments, experiences and taking the drugs and whatnot. They would, they would use music to help get them in the right frame of mind with the, with the spiritual world, they would say. And obviously they, were used, they would use the wrong music, they used bad music and, and not doing the right things and not glorifying God. But that, that, that being said, just to show you some of the power behind the music. And I've already preached an entire sermon called The Devil's Music and how powerful that is in causing you to sin and getting into your head and teaching you wicked things. But um, on, the opposite, on the opposite side of that, singing the right song, singing the good things in church, hey, that's going to help you get in the right spirit, get in the spirit of God. You know, we don't want the spirit of the world, which is what the world's music is going to offer you. You don't want to be listening to that stuff and just get into the spirit of the world. Because the Bible says that, that you know, friendship with the world is enmity with God. You don't want to be God's enemy. We don't want to get into that spirit. We want to get into the right spirit and the Holy Spirit, be filled with the spirit by speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, melody in our hearts to the Lord. So I kind of segued into this already. What should we be saying? The Bible calls it a new song. Turn back to Psalms. Turn, turn to Psalm chapter 40. I'm going to blow through a few of these. Psalm 40, and then we're going to be jumping to Psalm 33, if you want to put your finger there. Psalm chapter 40, and verse number 3 says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Jump back to Psalm 33. Once you get saved, you need a new song. We don't need the world's music anymore. You don't want the spirit of the world. We want the Holy Spirit. We need a new song. And it doesn't mean like, oh, I need a new song, something that was written in 2014. No, a new song is going to be new to you. After you get saved, well, you know, when you're in the world, you're going to like the things of the world. You're going to be into the, the things of the world. But when you get saved, now you need a new song. Now you need to, to, to get rid of the world, the garbage, and sting something that's new to you. Something that, that God is going to appreciate. Look at Psalm 33, verse number 1. The Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten str strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. Turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter Psalm 96. <clears throat> Psalm 96. Verse number 1 says, O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. And again, there's a new song, but look at how many times the Bible is saying to sing. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. It's something that God wants us to do. Singing should be an important part of your life. And singing and just making praises to God. Uh, Psalm 98, you're in Psalm 96. Just flip over to Psalm 98, verse number 1. The Bible says, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. So we're seeing now, I'm going to keep reading, but we're seeing here, you know, we're seeing a new song. Why are we seeing a new song? It says, for he hath done marvelous things. This is one of the reasons. God has done so many marvelous things. And you'll notice the, 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 some of the common themes of these songs, especially in the book of Psalms. It's victories and triumphs over the enemy, triumphs over the heathen. You know, great miracles that God does when God brings great deliverance unto his people. You know, there's a lot of songs about the children of Israel being saved out of Egypt from the house of bondage. There's songs of hope. 
When you're going through hard times, you get hope in God and, 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 and His, um, and His mercies. There's songs of thanksgiving, just giving praise unto God and being real thankful for the things that He does for us. There's songs, a lot of songs, actually we're going to see here real soon, about judgment and being happy and joyful. And we saw that this morning as well. God's mercy enduring forever and singing praises because God is going to come and judge and because God's a righteous judge. And He's going to set things right. And that's the thing to be happy about. Nobody's happy about injustice. When they got these pedophiles just getting a slap on the wrist and going back out and defiling more kids. Hey, that's a sad thing. That's a, that's a horrible thing. We want to see God come and set the record straight here. I mean, it would be great to just have any justice. Yeah. You know, even if it's not God setting the record straight, just if the justice system actually carried out true justice and was able to give proper penalties and punishments on sins. You know, if adultery was receiving the death penalty again, hey, praise God for that. You know, we would wait for that day. That will be a joyful occasion when that happens. And it's unlikely probably to happen in our lifetime with our current government. But hey, praise God when Jesus Christ comes back and he institutes the law the way that it ought to be set up and the, and the judgments the way that it ought to be set up. And uh, some other themes about songs that we see in the book of Psalms is just basic songs um, extolling God. You know, for his righteousness and for his holiness and for how perfect he is. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of themes that we'll see, and we're seeing here in Psalm 98 <clears throat> um, about a new song being sung. For he hath done marvelous things. Verse number one, verse number two. It says, "The Lord hath made known his salvation; his righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen." He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth hath, have seen the salvation of our God. So again, singing and extolling God for his mercy, for his truth. Verse 4, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Get loud in church. I love it when the kids just belt it out. I love it when the adults belt it out. I want to hear, and that's because the kids don't care. They're singing with their hearts. Hey, I want to hear the adults doing the same thing. Just sing out. Make a loud noise unto the Lord. Sing with all of your heart. Who cares what the person next to you is going to think and be like, oh man, I can't believe they're singing that loud. They don't sound that good. Hey, who cares what they think? Think about what God thinks. Yeah. Amen. That's who is receiving the joy anyways. It's your sacrifice unto God. Verse number five, sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm, with trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. Again, there's that, that reference to judgment. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. So we see here, it's a joyful noise. Hey, we're going to be happy in these songs and these praises that we sing unto God. Hey, be happy about them. And this last part here is because God's coming to judge the earth. That's a joyful occasion for us that are, that are, that are saved. It's not so joyous for those that aren't. But that's why we need to go out and preach the gospel to them and get them saved so that they could rejoice as well when Jesus Christ comes back. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 9. I'm going to read from 1 Chronicles chapter 16. The Bible says, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day His salvation. Declare His glory among the heathen, His marvelous works among all nations, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. So again, some more, some more of the common themes. Show forth His salvation from day to day. We sing verily, verily, a song that's just, just grounded and founded in truth of, of you know, eternal security and that all we have to do is put our faith in Christ to be saved. Um, showing forth God's salvation through songs, through praise, declaring His glory and, and His marvelous works. Look at Psalm 9, verse number 1. The Bible reads, To the chief musician upon Methalbim, the Psalm of David, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. Again, using all of your heart. This comes up over and over again. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. 
For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in the throne judging right. So, you know, many of these songs we see were, you know, talking about God bringing victory over their enemies. My enemies are turned back. God's fighting for us. God's with us. God's judging righteously. Verse 5, thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. This is, this is a joyful song. Mm -hmm. This is not a sorrowful song. This is a joyful song. It says, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. A great day. Verse number nine, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Hey, God's our strength. God's someone we can go to. Again, another reason to exalt his name and to sing praises unto his name. And they that know thy name, verse 10, will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. Look at all the great doctrine that's packed in here. In verse number 10, it says that, um, For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. You know, God's not going to forsake you. He's talking about... Um, Consider my trouble, which I suffer. You know, talk about praying to God for, for the people that hate me, that, you know, you'll lift me up from the gates of death and putting your trust into God, showing forth the praise in the gates, um, rejoicing in, in God's salvation. Verse number 15, the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. You know, people reaping what they sow. You know, the heathen that are out to destroy you, oftentimes they're going to they're gonna find themselves caught in their own net. Great truth there. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higayon, Selah. Verse number 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. And there we see more, again, more judgment in this psalm. This is a, I mean, this is a song of God. This is in God's word, and it's a song, and it's mentioning the wicked being turned to hell, which is going to be a righteous judgment. But not just that, the expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. There's hope. Look, there's hope for the poor. There's hope for the oppressed. There's hope for those that are on the wrong end receiving from the wicked. Verse number 19, Arise, O Lord, let, no ma let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. So, and this is just one example. Psalm 9, we read the whole thing. This is just one example of all the Psalms. And anyone who's read all the Psalms, I mean, you know, there is so much doctrine packed into these songs. This is the way that God likes to be praised. This is what God's talking about when we sing praises and sing Psalms unto Him. You know, obviously, over and over again, we see how great God's mercy is. And, and, and that's why so many of the songs we sing, I mean, are just the really joyful song about God's grace and his mercy and everything else. But there's also a lot of good doctrine here talking about the wicked being turned to hell and about God's judgment and his righteous judgment coming in that we ought to be singing about as well. I mean, these are, these are great songs, the book of Psalms, and there's so much to learn here. Um, the last place we're going to turn, I'm going to wrap it up, Psalm 150, the last psalm in the book of Psalms. We're going to see how, how God finishes this entire collection of songs in Psalm 150. And how important this is. This is an important subject for us today. This is not, you know, there's an entire, the, the longest book of the Bible, the book of Psalms, 150 chapters, 150 Psalms. It's like that for a reason. It should be an integral part of your life. In church, yes. But also in your, just in your regular life. Singing praises unto God. God wants to hear this. Look at verse number one of Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. That's a commandment. Praise ye the Lord. Hey, you do it. Praise ye the Lord. 
ye, all of you, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Does God want anyone excluded from this? No. I don't think. That last verse says it all. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. God wants everyone to sing praises unto his name. God wants to hear it from everyone. You, don't, you can't say, oh, my voice isn't that good. It doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever the reason is, I'm shy. What, it doesn't matter what your reason is. God wants you to praise him. God wants to hear that praise. And he even mentions, I didn't even go into this at all tonight. I'm not going to really. But he mentions a lot of music too. Musical instruments. The right kind of instrument. I mean, we see harps and cymbals and trumpets. All kinds of things. Hey, God appreciates that. God enjoys that. God wants to hear a joyful sound and praises sung unto his name and just hearing about how great he is. He wants to hear that from us, how much we adore him, how much we love the fact that he's done so much stuff for us. Express that to God. And again, one way to think about this, think about if your children were to make up a song or to sing a song that was about you or for you, and it was all about how great you are, what a great person you are, how much they love you, and, and, and all of these different things, how much that would melt your heart. Because I know that, that that would be an incredible blessing to hear from my children to do that for me. And, and that is the way that God is going to view us. God wants it coming from your heart. Again, I mean, He doesn't want you just going through the motions. Sing the praises from your heart. Be thankful to God. We have a lot to be thankful Amen. for. And if, if you do have a struggle with this, if you really don't like singing that much, meditate, maybe think about some of these Spend a lot of time in the book of Psalms and you can see the things that David's singing about and others in Asaph and these other men of God that have, that have put down on paper. Obviously, it's the word of God, but these people have put down all these great things to be thankful for and, and to just praise God for and really get into this scripture to get your heart right to want to sing praises unto your God that you would want to make him happy. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the wonderful things for you do for us. God, for your mercy that endures forever, for the, for the loving kindness that you have towards us, for the free gift of salvation, Lord. Help us to sing these praises and, and even that other people can hear it, dear God. There's so much doctrine packed into these songs. Help us to, to teach our children and the next generations, dear Lord, songs that have great doctrine in them so that... If they ever decide to get out of church, that these songs that they learn will be stuck in their heads and that they'll come back to them, dear Lord, in remembrance when maybe they end up doing the wrong things and they'll, and they'll, they'll think about these songs and then use that to get right with you, dear Lord, that, that they might be a testimony against them um, if needs be. But also that, that we can just teach them good doctrine and good things, dear God. I pray that you would please just help us all to have the right heart. Stir us up, dear Lord. There's so much to be thankful for. There's so many reasons to praise your name. Help us to get this to be a part of our regular daily life. Um, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, dear Lord, we're going we're gonna to sing praises unto your names. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.